Hello, my name is Marissa Ciparino and I'm the registered dietitian on the Community Navigation Team at Holyoke Medical Center. Today we're going to talk about how to start the new year off on a healthy foot. And I know that setting New Year's resolutions can be tricky, so find a time after the holidays calm down that works best for you and try to pick one or two things that we talk about today to start with. And as those become habit, then you can start and by adding in a few more. We are going to talk about what exactly nutrition is because this can be very confusing, especially on the internet and on uh, news clips and in the media. We're gonna talk about how to understand that we need to fuel our bodies and the best ways to do that and understand general healthy guidelines. So it's important to always take into consideration any medical conditions that you do have before following these guidelines because you as an individual may have to do things a little bit differently. And finally, we are going to talk about where to start because this is a long journey and the, our health is not a race. So we want to do one or two things at a time that are going to become habit and comfortable before we add in more. The idea here is that we keep the motivation going year round and also keep in mind that we're not really going to be focusing on any fad diets or temporary fixes that we often see pop up uh, in conversation, on social media, and throughout the community. I did want to start off by first talking about body mass index, or as it's more commonly referred to, BMI. It's important to know that this measure of our height, the ratio of our height and weight, was first used to study people mostly European men over the age of 18 many years ago. So it may be something that you talk about in the doctor's office, but I want to make sure that we're all comfortable knowing that BMI does not tell the whole story of our health. So yes, it is a measure of the ratio between our height and weight but it does not consider things like water mass, muscle mass, and fat mass. So it is not necessarily the best indicator of our individual health status. And originally, BMI was not supposed to be a tool used by the common public, but rather public health scientists doing research. So with that being said, health is not just a number. And one of the myths that I'd love to dispel today is the myth that muscle weighs more than fat. So with that being said, we have to understand that weight does not always equal volume. So in this case, you could actually be losing weight and seeing a change in your pant size, but not actually see a change on the scale for several weeks. The best example that I have of this is uh, that comparison between a one pound brick and a one pound bag of feathers. So they both equal a pound. One pound is one pound. They weigh the same, but the brick takes up much less space or volume like muscle compared to a bag of feathers that is much more uh, robust in size because of uh, the amount of feathers that you need to equal a pound. So keep in mind, and the next time this conversation comes up at the dinner table, let everyone know that muscle does not weigh more than fat. So moving on, let's define nutrition. Nutrition is the study of how food affects the health of our bodies. Nutrition encompasses the idea that food is fuel and energy for our bodies. It is a series of chemical reactions, many billion that happen over the course of a day throughout our bodies. 
And nutrition is always evolving because it's become such a hot topic. So there is a lot more research being done around nutrition. So be forgiving if something gets updated and make sure that you're getting your information from credible sources, okay? So a one line blurb on Facebook doesn't tell you the whole story about nutrition or whatever uh, food topic is being covered. So we have to understand that while eggs might have got a bad rap in the 80s, they are very much making a comeback for many people now and are considered a healthy choice depending on what your individual health conditions are. So let's be as forgiving for nutrition as we are for regular medical uh, science and development. We don't do heart surgery the way we used to, and we certainly don't want to eat or understand nutrition the way we used to many years ago. Now, what is a calorie? First of all, not my favorite word, but it's a very commonly used word. So I think that we need to spend some time on it. And if we're getting technical, it's actually the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Sounds compl complicated, right? But ultimately, that chemical reaction that happens in our bodies in converting food into energy using heat is why our bodies can function every day. So our bodies can store calories and burn calories to be used as fuel. But should we count them? This has been a heavily debated conversation. And in my opinion, and uh, most people who study nutrition do agree that the quality of a calorie does not always equal the quantity. So a 100 calorie bag of chips does not equal 100 calories of an apple or a piece of fruit. Those two things are the same amount of calories, but they don't have the same quality and they don't offer us the same nutrition benefits. So with that being said, I also prefer to use the word meal plan instead of diet when designing how we wanna balance our calories throughout the day because diet often seems like a temporary word when it comes to changing how we eat. And we want you to develop new healthy habits that become part of your meal plan that you're comfortable with and that you're able to use almost effortlessly throughout the day as you get more practice improving your nutrition. So which types of calories provide our bodies with energy? And we have to think about big nutrients and small nutrients when looking at this question. So the three main nutrients that give our bodies energy are called macronutrients. These are carbohydrates, protein, and fat. These are the three nutrients that give our bodies calories and energy. Things like vitamins and minerals are essential for those chemical processes that we talked about earlier, but they don't provide energy. Just as important, but no energy. And when we look at that piece of cake compared to that apple, we're going to get a lot more vitamins and minerals from that 100 calorie apple than we are from that 100 calorie slice of cake. Now, water is not a source of energy for our bodies, but we need it in large amounts, just like our carbs, protein, and fat. So not a calorie, no energy there, but just as important. And we actually need it if we are in a state of starvation more than we need food because we can only go a few days without water, but we can make it a week or so without food. So what is a carbohydrate? 
ask yourself this. We're all seeing in the news about carbs and how we have to cut back on them or cut them out altogether. And I want to help you decide which ones are going to be better choices most often. So carbohydrate is a fancy umbrella term for sugar, starches, and fiber. And that's why it is the uh, top of the label piece for carbohydrates. And underneath the food label, under carbohydrates, you'll see things like sugar and fiber broken down. What do they do? Now, remember, if we are our just thinking about general healthy nutrition and not very specific and individualized diets like keto, carbohydrates are going to be the main source of energy for our brains and our blood. So if you at some point have chosen to follow a low carb diet or the Atkins diet or the keto diet without any proper professional guidance, you may have found that you've become very fatigued and weak. And that's because you're essentially trying to run your body without putting any gas in it. So keep in mind that for minimum daily requirements and for good brain function, we need around 130 grams of carbohydrates per day. And for some of you, that may sound like a lot, but it may only sound like a lot because you don't know what your baseline should be. So keep this number in mind moving forward. This can equate to about 45 to 65% of our total daily calories. And that percentage broken down into grams of carbohydrates is gonna be different for me than it is for you. So if you really want to get a breakdown of what you should be eating, then you can reach out to your doctor and see if they can put in a referral for you to meet with a registered dietitian. That's the best way for you to get your individualized meal plan, not running down the hall to your neighbor and asking them what they do every day, okay? We're gonna go through each macronutrient and I'm gonna give you some food label tips to help you break down that food label too. So remember, total carbohydrates includes all types of carbs, sugar, starch, and fiber. And a combination of these will give you a balanced choice when it comes to carbohydrates. Now try to keep this next point in the back of your mind because we're gonna come back to it later. One gram of carbs, any type of carb, equals four calories. One gram, four calories. Fiber is a very special type of carbohydrate because it's actually non-digestible for the most part. So what this means is it helps us go to the bathroom, control our cholesterol by collecting some bad stuff in our bloodstream and eliminating it. And it helps to keep us full longer. So that's why we would prefer when possible that you eat the apple instead of drinking apple juice. When you drink something that has been processed to that degree, you're actually removing the fiber. So the apple, which could keep you full for a couple hours or so with a combination of nuts or cheese, will, will be a much better and sustainable choice than a glass of juice, which you may drink running out the door on a busy morning, only to find yourself hungry in an hour or so. Now the goal, for our fiber intake is about 25 grams for women and 35 grams for men per day. But if you are not someone that has eaten a lot of fiber in their diet from fresh fruits and vegetables, beans and whole grains, you wanna start increasing the amount of fiber in your diet very slowly over several weeks. We don't want you to experience any stomach upset or struggle with constipation. To help with this transition, you want to drink a lot of water. 
So if your goal is to increase fiber, also increase your water intake. The best part about fiber under the carbohydrate uh, category on the food label is that it actually doesn't provide calories. So if a food is high in fiber or five grams or more per the serving on the food label, we actually get to subtract those grams of fiber from the total carbs. So if the total carbs on a package are listed at 30 grams, but there are six grams of fiber in that serving size, now we are only going to digest 24 grams, but you will get to stay full longer and and feel satisfied from that meal. Now that we've defined a carb, let's talk about which foods it can be found in. I try to avoid using good and bad when possible. So you'll notice here that we're going to list carbs by which ones are best, which ones are fair choices, and which ones you want to limit. So again, think of your body like a car. We don't put low quality gas in our car because we don't want to ruin it and we want to get the most out of that tank of gas. So the same thing goes for our bodies and the foods that we choose to consume. The best forms of carbohydrates are going to be your fresh and frozen fruit, low fat dairy like yogurt, cheese, and milk, and beans and legumes. So these are where you're gonna get the most bang for your buck out of those grams of carbs, okay? Foods that have carbs that we want to be aware of when portioning them out on our plate include things like starchy vegetables. So these would be our potatoes, our corn, peas, winter squash, and our viandas or Puerto Rican starchy vegetables. Also included here are gonna be whole grains, and that includes bread, rice, barley, quinoa, and pasta. So we can have them, but we just wanna watch the portions and understand that they are not the main event or the main star of the show on our plates. They are just a side dish. And if you need some help measuring out what that portion size should be, Consider a computer mouse one serving of carbohydrate. And maybe when you design your individual meal plan with your registered dietitian, we'll talk about having maybe two or three servings of that computer size, a uh, computer mouse size amount of food. Finally, the carbs that we really do want to be careful of, and this really goes for all ages. And at this stage in the game, especially children, we want to limit our sugar sweetened beverages. So that includes everything from juice, soda, sweet tea, energy drinks, and mixed alcoholic beverages. We often don't uh, think about it, but the sugar that we put in our coffee and tea counts too. And that includes honey, syrup, and agave, okay? Our processed starches or grains like crackers and cereal and chips are also in this category. Finally, as you may have guessed, are sweets. Cake, cookies, candy, ice cream, things that have a lot of added sugar. Added sugar are carbs that are added to a food during its processing in a factory. So, Milk straight out of the cow has 12 grams of sugar or lactose, but chocolate milk made in a factory has those 12 grams of sugar naturally there, plus what a factory added to it to give it that chocolate flavor. And those are the types of carbs that we wanna be careful of because they're only going to give us quick bursts of energy and leave us tired and hungry an hour or so later. Moving on to protein, our next macronutrient, 
I personally feel that this one is the most straightforward. Protein helps us to grow and develop and provide us with the building blocks to give us muscle strength, bone strength, and protect us from uh, getting injured all the time. It's also useful for healing and repair if we have wounds or bruises or just had surgery. So it's unfortunately much easier to lose muscle than it is to gain it. Again, going back to the muscle weighs more than fat concept, you'd have to work really, really hard to uh, gain muscle mass, almost like uh, Rocky or bodybuilding, which again is something you wanna talk to your medical team about, okay? You may also find as you increase uh, muscle, a protein in your diet, you may actually get sick less. And that's because proteins and amino acids, which are the building blocks of our genes and DNA, can prevent us from getting sick as easily. So another benefit to the protein is that it helps with our immune function. And finally, it also helps us to stay full. So when we're making that meal, we wanna make sure we've got some protein on the plate in some way, shape, or form. All right, here's our numbers tip. One gram of protein equals four calories. Sound familiar? It should, because one gram of carbs equals four calories too. So right now, they're both equal if we're looking at calories. Proteins come from a variety of foods. And the easiest way to remember this, first and foremost, is our animal products. So all animal products have protein. That includes uh, milk and eggs, okay? So we do have to be careful with our animal products because they also include fat. And fat on an animal product is white. So this includes our chicken skin, the marbling in our steak, and that border that we often find on our uh, pork chops or pork cuts of meat, like the shoulder. So you wanna be choosing leaner animal products when doing your grocery shopping. And the benefit here is that you'll actually get more bang for your buck. So yes, it does cost a little bit more to get leaner meat, but you're actually gonna get to consume more of that uh, in the form of protein, not fat, and stay full longer. And you may even find you have to eat less of it because you're, you're not uh, getting the fat. Protein can also be found in our fish and shellfish. Again, they do have fat, but they have some of our most healthy fats that are anti-inflammatory. We can get protein from beans and legumes, which also have carbs and fiber, eggs, low-fat, unsweetened dairy, like milk, yogurt, and cheese, nuts and seeds, and our soy products. There are many more plant-based products that are high in protein now on the market too, but just be careful that you're getting them in their least processed form, unsweetened, and that you know how to prepare them because that can be very tricky. So if you're trying to fo follow a plant-based diet, make sure that you are including things like tofu, kefir, seitan, tempeh, if you don't like these things, it's gonna be very difficult for you to get the protein in that you need throughout the day. Now, our proteins that we wanna moderate, again, include our whole grains. So yes, there are proteins in there, but they are not going to be our primary source of protein because they are merely a side dish on the plate. Finally, the protein that we want to limit are our cured and processed deli meats, okay? As well as things like the skin on the chicken and the border around our steak and pork. Deli meats and cured meats 
uh, are very high in fat and salt. So we do want to moder moderate how much of this we have throughout the week. Finally, my favorite nutrient or macronutrient is fat. And to me, this gets more of a bad rap than carbohydrates, but it is a very essential macronutrient. It helps protect our organs so that if we bump into something, we're not puncturing a lung or damaging our stomach. Uh, it helps protect our hair, skin, and nails, keeping them strong and shiny so they're not breaking all the time. And it's like the mailman of our bloodstream. So it helps us to absorb and transport vitamins and minerals, especially our fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. This is the only time that I use the words good and bad when evaluating foods because there truly are some sources of fat that are just not ideal for us to consume at any stage in life. And we will go over that next. But time for our numbers tip. One gram of fat equals nine calories. So remember carbs and protein are one gram to four calories. So fat has more calories per bite than carbs and protein. And that's why we have to be careful with things like nuts and salad dressings and oils because the portion size is much smaller. But if we're not careful with our measuring, the calories on the plate from fat can really add up quickly. Which foods have fat? Well, fortunately, a lot of foods with fat are good sources of fat. So we have our mono and our poly unsaturated fats, which are often listed on the food label. They're not required, but if they're there, it chances are that they are present uh, in that food. And I try to remember mono and poly by thinking of mom and pop, you know, to try to remember that these are going to be our good sources of fat. These include things like nuts and seeds, oily fishes like salmon, mackerel, and tuna, and uh, other seeds like chia, flax, and sunflower. Egg yolks, which yes, do have cholesterol, but we are finding that the cholesterol that we consume is not the source of high cholesterol on our blood work. That actually comes from saturated fat, which we'll get to next. Our mono and polyunsaturated fats are also found in things like avocado oil, olive oil, sesame oil, and grapeseed oil. But not all of these oils are created equally. Avocado oil, in my opinion, is the best cooking oil because it can tolerate a high heat, which means you only need to use a very little bit in the pan and you don't have to keep adding more. A lot of us waste good olive oil cooking in the pan when it really shouldn't be exposed to heat at all because it was made for things like marinades and dressing. So look at the labels and look in the grocery store on the shelves because there's a lot more education about which oils to use on signs in the grocery store. Most of your popular olive oil brands will also list on the label of the bottle what you should use that olive oil for. So if it says use for sauteing and stir frying, then that is a good olive oil to use on heat. But if it says use for dipping salad dressings and marinades, then you don't want to put that in the pan. Save that for a little bit of a nice oil and vinegar dressing. I hope that helped a little bit. You don't have to get avocado oil, which does not taste like avocados, but if you are going to use olive oil, make sure it's designed to be used on higher temperatures. 
soybean, vegetable, and corn oils are considered healthy fats, but unfortunately, between all the processing they go through and the blend of different things used to make them, they're not recommended as our everyday cooking oils. Saturated fats, like things from animals, so butter, milk, ice cream, these things we want to limit to less than about 12 to 15 grams per day. But if you are somebody that makes a lot of foods from packages or frozen dinners, you're going to see that these foods are much higher in saturated fat, fast food included. Here you'll also notice that coconut oil is listed in the yellow zone. Now there was a time when coconut oil was all over the news and it was very popular. But what we are learning is that coconut oil is higher in the saturated fats and in some cases more so than butter than it is in the unsaturated fats. Does that mean that you can't ever use coconut oil? No, but it shouldn't be your main everyday source when cooking. A lot of people choose to use it in their hair or on their skin for lotion, and that's fine. Uh, but again, you don't want to be using it every day. You want to make a nice coconut curry Thai dish, that's fine. But again, not for use every day. Finally, we have our trans fats. These unfortunately are the bad guys. The good news is that they are being phased out of our food supply and will become illegal for use once all the big companies are able to make the transition. And when you're seeing this, that very well could have already happened. And then we'll finally have caught up with many countries in Europe that have already made this adjustment. We don't see it very much on the label anymore, but it is required to be listed there. So we find it in things that are pre-made, especially our baked goods, uh, pre-prepared snacks, and things like margarine and shortening. So be very careful. Just because the label says zero, if on that ingredient list, it lists partially hydrogenated oils, there could still be some trans fats, but it falls below the threshold that has to be listed on the label. So if something says zero trans fat, but partially hydrogenated oil is on the ingredient list, it means it's less than 0.5 grams per serving. But if you eat three servings of that food, now you've received 1.5 grams of trans fat. And that's a concern because it's directly related to heart disease. So this will get easier as the food supply changes. Hopefully by now, you know the answer to this question, but which nutrient can we live without? Technically, none of them, okay? So now that we've defined nutrition, we have to figure out where to start when changing our habits. I've created a way to try to help you remember this. And it's the four B's, balance, bed, breakfast, and beverages. So maybe after today, you pick one or two of these things to work on first, and then in a few weeks or months, you pick a few more. Balance is key. And again, we can go back to the cake versus apple argument, or here we can look at the fruit versus the fast food burger. They may have the same type of cal uh, amount of calories, but not the same type of calories, okay? So we wanna balance those carbs, protein, and fat uh, adequately throughout our plate. My plate, many years ago, replaced the food guide pyramid, which a lot of you may be familiar with. And again, this was designed for the general public. So it may not be the best design for you if you have diabetes or heart disease, but it's a start. 
And what you can see here is that there is no one food group overtaking the plate compared to another. So we've got our fruits, we've got our vegetables, our whole grains, our protein, and our dairy. Not pictured here is our little bit of fat, but we can talk about that. So in 2021, January, the dietary guidelines for Americans are actually being updated, which is very exciting. So stay tuned for that. But currently we are working off of these five main points when we are uh, trying to improve the health of our overall country. So in general, we want to try to follow a healthy eating pattern across our whole lifespan, focus on a variety of nutrient dense foods. These are the ones that are gonna give you good bang for your buck, keep gas in that car and continue on that uh, road trip without any problems to our health. We wanna limit the calories from those added sugars, saturated fats and salts, which we've already covered. And we wanna shift to healthier food and beverage choices. Finally, we want to support healthy eating patterns for all. So if you notice, these guidelines are pretty generalized and that's because the USDA recognizes that there are going to be different meal plans that are gonna be better fitting for one population than another. So the idea here is that you use this as a starting point and then you reach out to your medical team for help on how to individualize things. I know that there's a lot of concern about eating healthy and what that means for your hunger, but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about how to manage our hunger and identify where it's coming from. So you present hungry at some point during the day. I want you to ask yourself, but are you really hungry? Or is it some sort of emotion that's triggering that hunger? If you ate a very balanced meal, like that picture I showed you earlier, about an hour ago, chances are there's some sort of emotion playing into where your hunger is coming from. And this can be both a negative and positive emotion. So it could be stress, depression, anxiety, sleep deprivation, even sadness, but it can also be happiness, celebration or reward that's triggering that hunger. So think about that next time you decide to treat your children for good behavior or good grades. Try not to use food so we can start building those healthy habits at a young, early age. If you really do struggle with emotional eating, I recommend that you try to find a behavioral health professional who can help you through those emotions. But don't forget to talk about food. It's often forgotten about in those sessions, but can play a huge role in how you cope through those uh, difficult emotions that you are experiencing. You've heard me mention it, but here it is, the food label. And a lot of you may have noticed that in recent years, it's been getting a revamp. And this is because this food label has been in place for over 30 years without much change until now. So it's time, it's time to update it given the current trend of our health in the United States. Where do we start? Well, it would seem self-explanatory, but the label can be deceiving. We actually start at the very, very top serving size, and then we work our way down. But the new label, as you can see, has calories listed in a very large font. So it's going to be tricky because that's where our eye is going to wanna go to first. We must start at the serving size because if we eat that serving size on the label, it will then dictate everything underneath it without any change. But if we eat half the amount of the serving size, or in this case, two thirds of a cup, so we only eat one third, we now have to divide all the numbers underneath by two. If we eat twice the amount, so one and one third cups of ice cream, let's say, 
we now have to multiply all of those numbers by two. So I understand nobody told me that nutrition was a lot of math when I went into the field, but once you get the hang of it, I promise the grocery store won't feel like the library anymore. So unfortunately, the serving size is not actually the recommended serving size for a particular food that we should eat. It's actually based on what the average American eats. So even though here, the serving size for ice cream is listed at two thirds of a cup, for you individually, that may not mean you should eat two thirds of a cup. So keep that in mind because a lot of packages now are going to start including what one serving is and what the entire package is. And you're going to have to use your judgment and keep your health goals in mind when deciding how much to put on your plate. Also remember, it's not the quantity of the calories, it's the quality of them. So if something listed on the label looks low carb, it could very well still be high fat. So that's something that we would break down together on an individual level if you get to meet with a registered dietitian. The next B is breakfast. Now, unless you are following a supervised intermittent fasting plan with your medical team, I don't recommend skipping it. And you can see here, it doesn't have to be boring or hard to prepare. So we have a meal prep example on the left and a nice warm savory option on the right with the ham and some spinach, tomato, and an egg. So it doesn't have to be boring or hard, but it has to be there if you are uh, following the general healthy guidelines. And I've mentioned it before, but think of your body like a car. If you're not following a special fasting plan, you do want to avoid skipping those meals because the rest of the day is depending on it. So space those meals about four hours apart, and that includes breaks in between because we don't drive our cars attached to the gas tank. So we have to give our bodies a chance to process the food that we eat before we add more. If we're always eating all day long, our bodies will never get to burn our fat stores. It'll just be burning the calories that we eat and then storing what it doesn't need. And that's where snacking can get a lot of us in trouble when weight management and diabetes control are, are our goals. So our health is a road trip, not a sprint or not a race, okay? So as you make these changes to your lifestyle, you're actually doing preventative maintenance on your body, just like we do on a car. So it does take a little bit of planning, but if you can set aside an hour or so per week, it makes your mornings much easier, especially on those busy days. Be realistic. You don't have to eat things you don't like, but if you know that you get bored with the same thing, you might have to get a little bit creative with your registered dietitian. So balance that plate too, back to that first B. It doesn't have to be the same thing every morning, or it doesn't even have to be your traditional idea of breakfast. A lot of other countries eat dinner type foods for breakfast, and that includes our vegetables. So try to sneak some in there if you're making an omelet or something along those lines. Unfortunately, cereal is like having dessert for breakfast. So not you don't want it to be, again, the main star of the show. A nice uh, steel cut oatmeal could be part of it, but not all of it. Try to avoid overeating. We can be very busy in the morning and not even be paying attention to how quickly we eat, which ultimately can result in eating more. So try to carve out 10, 15 minutes or so where you are only eating without interruption. I know it can be hard, but I promise that you'll see a lot of benefit from just being a little bit more mindful and you'll experience better hunger control, uh, ability to focus, and better energy throughout the day if you just take a few extra minutes. You do have to spend a little time now to save a little time later. 
I love this example of food swaps that you can make for your breakfast. So at, on the left, we have a sugar sweetened yogurt and a processed muffin. On the right, we have plain unsweetened yogurt with some nuts, some fruit, and I like to add a touch of cinnamon. So we're still getting the sweetness, but we've controlled the carbs and the sugar that have gone into that yogurt by using fresh or frozen fruit. If you make these ahead of time and you use frozen fruit, by the time that fruit melts, it actually mixes the yogurt very well and, and you won't miss the uh, added sugars from the pre-fruited type. At the bottom, we have a fast food breakfast wrap for 600 calories, which is a lot. Uh, if your goals for the day are only about 12 to 1500 calories, for example. But look on the right how much more food you can get for half the amount of calories and twice the amount of nutrition. If you make those breakfast burritos yourself ahead of time and you keep them in the freezer and just pull out a piece of fruit to go with them, you actually get to eat a lot more and feel more satisfied than you would with the food on the left. Now, back to balance, I want to talk about our blenders. We must be aware of them. It's very easy to put a lot of ingredients in a blender that we would never sit down and eat whole on a plate. We don't eat an apple, banana, some berries, peanut butter, yogurt, flaxseed, and spinach all on one plate most of the time but a lot of people don't have a problem putting it in the blender. So think about that balance. If you wouldn't normally eat it whole on the plate, then it can't go in the blender. A lot of uh, folks who try to do smoothie diets often start gaining weight because they don't realize this key point. So lay out all your ingredients first and then decide where your fat is coming from, where your protein is coming from, and where your carbs will come from. Protein here is key. It's going to keep you full longer. Fat is key for helping you avoid those nutri- uh, Fat is key for helping you absorb those vitamins, and carbs are gonna give your brain that boost of energy it needs to get through the day. If you need to bulk up your, your smoothies, you can use more vegetables, non-starchy ones, but remember, if we are blending produce like fruits and vegetables, we are losing a little bit of the fiber because the blades are doing part of the digestion that our stomach normally would. So keep that in mind and maybe reserve a smoothie, a balanced smoothie for a busy day when you don't have as much time to prep. This is a great example of a smoothie recipe. So we have half of a medium banana, which is very important because bananas are quite large in the store now, half a cup of frozen mixed berries, half a cup of plain low fat Greek yogurt. And remember plain and vanilla yogurt are two different things. One tablespoon of almond butter, so those first, let's see, one, two, three, four ingredients have calories and the remaining ingredients do not. So that would be our half cup of spinach, half cup of water. And if you'd like to add in some flavorings like basil, mint, ginger, you can do so and not get any calories. All right, beverages. This is where it gets tricky because we often can start off on the wrong foot first thing in the morning. As we get older, our perception of thirst goes down. So it's much easier to get dehydrated. And when we are dehydrated, instead of getting thirsty, many times our bodies first get hungry. So what do we do? We eat. But then an hour later, we're hungry again. And the reason is because we really didn't fix the problem that was there in the first place, thirst. Hydration is key for hunger and weight management, and it must be no sugar options. 
which can be difficult, but we'll talk about what you can do to get variety. Water is also crucial for bowel function and digestion, like we talked about earlier with that fiber. It also helps to control infections and promote good skin care and wound healing. It's very important for repletion after exercise so that our muscles don't cramp. And it helps to replete electrolytes and regulate our body temperatures. Finally, we have to be extra careful about hydration at different times of the year. So in the summertime when it's hot, we are thirsty more because we're sweating more, which means we have to drink more. But in the winter time when it's cold, we don't have that mechanism reminding us as often because we're not sweating as much. So still try to set phone alarms, use a fancy water bottle, or think of some way to help you stay on track with your hydration. If not, things like uh, change in mood, poor sleep habits, and headaches can set in just from dehydration alone. So how can we hydrate so that it's not boring? Well, on average, women need about 12 cups of water and men need about 15 uh, every day. Good news is we can get some hydration from our fruits and vegetables. So that's why the 12 cups and 15 cups often comes across as about eight cups on average per day. This is assuming that you're following a balanced diet where water also uh, is present. So by changing some of your snacks or uh, portions of food on your plate to fruits and vegetables, you can help to uh, avoid the, the pressure of drinking uh, 10 water bottles per day. Decaf, no calorie beverages are going to be your best sources of hydration. So unfortunately, caffeine can be a bit dehydrating and so can very sugary beverages, especially if we combine those with alcohol. Think about how parched we feel the next day. But you can infuse water with fresh fruits and vegetables. So what I like to do with produce in my fridge that's about to go bad that I know I'm not gonna eat, I just throw it in a pitcher of water and that pitcher of water can last another seven days and give you good flavor without all the added sugar. Herbal tea is another nice option, especially if you're looking for something warm. You do want to limit alcohol, but be aware that if you're going to drink it, you need to drink water as well. Sip frequently so that you don't feel like you're chugging all the time. Check your skin, check your hair, check your urine. If you're not on any high dose vitamins, your urine should be about the color of a post-it note throughout the day. It may be a little darker in the morning, but that's normal. Vitamin supplementation can make our urine uh, yellow all the time. So if you're on a lot of vitamins, urine may not be the best uh, check for you, but you can look at your skin to see how dry it is also. Some of you may have to restrict water because of a chronic condition that you have, so always check with your doctor. Traveling is another uh, problem for hydration because flying in an airplane can actually be uh, very drying for us. So that can make jet lag and adjusting to uh, getting off the plane in the next few days a little bit more difficult. So uh, try to stay well hydrated when you're flying on airplanes. Milk can count as hydration, but it also counts for protein, fat, and carbs. So that would be part of your meal and part of your hydration. You really wanna rethink the soda consumption because unfortunately it does contain more added sugar in one 20 ounce bottle than we should get in three days. So you'll notice the food label changing because the original serving size was 2.5 servings in a 12 ounce, uh, 20 ounce bottle, but none of us drink one third of the bottle, put it in the fridge, go back for the next one third the next day, and so on and so forth. 
So if you drink an entire 20 ounce bottle of regular soda, you're getting 16 to 18 teaspoons of added sugar. That is 64 to 72 grams. And the average woman should only have 25 grams and the average man should only have 36 grams of added sugar every day. So really be careful here. Uh, and I gave you the um, nutrition facts label for a sugar packet as well. So you can see that for every sugar packet you put in your coffee, you're adding four grams of sugar. So keep that in mind next time you reach for one of those. What can we drink? We talked about a lot of our options, but we also can have seltzer or flavored waters that have artificial sweeteners or the plant-based sweetener, stevia. Not everybody likes these and that's okay but they are an option for you. So our final B is bed. Sleep in it, but don't eat in it. I know it can be hard, but sleep is crucial for weight management, hunger control, good nutrition, healing, the whole nine yards. And I'm sure you've heard it before, but it is very important, especially if you're trying to control your weight your blood sugars, heart disease, mood, hormones, appetite. I could go on and on and on, but if you're feeling very stressed about managing all these things, try to evaluate your sleep too. The longer you are awake during the day, the more your body is going to want to eat. And that's because it has to get energy from somewhere. So if you're not giving that car time to repair, then it's going to ask for more gas. And that's when we often add in processed foods, convenience foods, and fast foods. So really evaluate your sleep schedule and get help if needed. I wanted to quickly go through some ways to get access to food if this is something that you and your family struggle with. So for those of you who are eligible for the um, Meals on Wheels or elderly services, the Massachusetts Association of Council on Aging is a great resource. And many of your local senior centers provide meals at a low cost. If you are a mom with young children, you may be eligible for WIC or Women, Infants, and Children. So reach out to your local social services office to get help with this. Finally, if you're looking for some meal delivery sites like the Mobile Food Bank, you can go on to a website called 413cares.org. And not only can you find sources, resources for foods, but you can find resources for housing and religion and transportation. So this is gonna be a great hub for people living in Western Massachusetts that ne may need help with some of those social services. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about food stamps, but food stamps has recently uh, gotten a lot more attention because of something called the Healthy Incentives Program. So if you have food stamps, you and your family are automatically eligible for HIP, Healthy Incentives Program. And what this means is in a household of one to two people, you get 40 extra dollars per month, three to five people get 60, and six or more get 80 extra dollars per month just by having food stamps. So if you have been hesitant to apply because you think you won't get very much, take these numbers into consideration because that extra money could be used for your milk and your eggs and some of your produce every month. How do you use it? Well, there are certain locations that accept HIP. You wanna go on the Massachusetts website and type in the zip code and it will tell you which local farmers markets, mobile markets, farm stands, and 
CSAs or community supported agricultural farm share programs participate in HIP. So it cannot be used at the grocery store, but if you shop the local food markets every season, you will be able to use HIP. Right now, it is accepted at Holyoke Farmers Market. Just look for the sign at each of the vendors, uh, farmers mostly, to see who is participating. Finally, if you wanna get your kids on board, you may have seen this message throughout Holyoke and it's called Let's Move Holyoke 5210. And the, the idea here is that we try to use color and excitement to get kids on board when making healthy choices. Five or more fruits and vegetables a day, two hours or less of recreational screen time, so fun time in front of the screen, one hour of physical activity, and it doesn't have to be all at once, it could be broken up into uh, smaller time frames. And finally, zero sugary drinks, okay? And this even goes for when kids are sick. Powerade and ginger ale and Gatorade, they're not good choices and they can be really dehydrating. So try to get those kids to avoid sugary drinks so that they don't have to worry about it when they become adults. Here are our, our core concepts for good nutrition. Mindfulness, immunity, sleep, exercise, and food. So a good balance of all of these things is really going to set you up for a happy, healthier, and more comfortable life. In summary, pick one or two small habits that we talked about today that you think you can be successful with, and then move on to a few more down the road. Monitor your portion sizes and just be aware of them even if you aren't changing them yet. Eat slow and start practice reading those food labels. Try to cut back on eating out when possible and exercise comfortably to the best of your ability intentionally. And that doesn't include things like walking the dog and doing the laundry. They're great activities, but you wanna go above and beyond that when possible. Hydrate well, and if you don't know what to do or where to start even after today, ask for help but make sure you're asking from credible sources that practice evidence-based nutrition and medicine. It can be scary, but starting slow is still a start. And remember, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So if you are trying to cut back on the amount of pills you have to take, try looking at your diet first so that you can develop a healthy meal plan. Have a great new year. I hope this helped and I look forward to seeing you through your journey.